Good morning, everyone. How are you doing? Excellent, excellent. Thanks for coming. Uh, in addition to uh, this being our 45-year anniversary as a company, this is our 30th annual Global Summit. Uh, so, uh, so welcome again. Uh, we have a great three days of content put together for you, and we're really happy to have you here, and hopefully you will get a lot uh, out of it and a lot out of interacting with each other uh, and, uh, and all of us. And hope you had a good day yesterday. Uh, the reception I thought was really nice. I don't know if you did golf or soccer. I heard that was good in the women's meetup and, and, uh, and some of the seminars uh, yesterday. So hopefully you're off to a roaring start uh, as well. Uh, today I will be your host for the morning, uh, and our theme is healthcare. Uh, so we'll be um, talking about healthcare. For those of you not in the healthcare business, at least you're all patients and experience the healthcare uh, system, uh, of course. But I love healthcare uh, myself. I've been in this industry my whole career after a brief, brief career at Dairy Queen, um, which, was, which was fun uh, as well. Um, but the beauty of healthcare is its technology, its public uh, and social good, its business, it's international, it's very interesting, uh, I, uh, I find. Um, and our theme is caring for the future uh, today. And so ultimately, healthcare is about uh, caring, caring for each other and our families and our, uh, and our communities. It has a, a lot of uh, depth and uh, in addition to the excitement of the industry. Uh, we have a lineup of great uh, speakers this morning. Uh, I will introduce each one as they come to the stage, so I won't do that uh, uh, right now. But uh, we really have a blend of public service and clinical and business from the largest companies to the smallest uh, companies. So we have a range of, of representation in our panel in addition to our, um, uh, our product team. We'll talk about some of the cool things that we're, uh, we're working on. So, but I'd like to start uh, and talk about innovation in, in healthcare IT. Uh, and the theme that I chose was a theme of fusion, uh, fusing sort of data and uh, the kind of data world and concerns with the user and what they're, uh, they're uh, thinking about. Uh, before, before I get started, does any, did anybody recognize the walk-in song uh, that I had when I walked on stage a few minutes ago? It was not the Maple Leaf Rag, the Entertainer. And who was the composer? Scott Joplin, exactly. Scott Joplin, I think, is one of the geniuses of the last century. Uh, and what's interesting about him uh, is he combined, he fused sort of two different music worlds uh, and traditions that had really never met musically, I would say. So you kind of had the European, uh, you know, what we call classical music these days. So European, you know, big harmony, formal kind of a music style with the African-American uh, more informal, more rhythmic and syncopated, call and response, kind of dance-oriented style of music and created ragtime. Uh, and ragtime was, uh, was hugely popular at that time. He was sort of the Taylor Swift of his, uh, of his uh, era. Um, and, uh, and eventually led to jazz and piano-based blues and sort of a lot of music uh, traditions uh, after that. Uh, but I think that's where a lot of innovation comes from and inflection points come from, is taking two sort of things that have been separate and bringing them uh, together to create something uh, new. Uh, and the two worlds that I think of that really need to come together, from my point of view, are sort of the world of data and the world of uh, users. And I'll describe uh, more as I go through uh, this. But what I mean by this is sort of, you know, most of us are in the data World. So we have certain things that we uh, think about. You know, we always think that more data is better. We like structured data. We like everything in its tables and columns and data types and everything in its, uh, everything in its place. We, we dream about performance and scalability and that sort of thing, just like Terry, uh, Terry mentioned. So those are the kinds of things we think about in the software and technology uh, world. But our users, you know, they're not... Um, it's not better or worse or anything like that. It's just a different set of concerns on their uh, mind. You know, they're thinking about uh, simplicity, uh, streamline, doing less work. You know, they're focused on patients uh, in healthcare, at least. Uh, they're not focused on the software or the computer or anything, anything like that. And ultimately, when it comes to dealing with us, they wish that software worked for them. 
Uh, and they too often feel like they are working for the software, that sort of they, their day is kind of spent sort of conforming to what we need in the data uh, world. But I think we can kind of fuse these two together and create something new by combining the concerns and the skills we have from the data world with the concerns um, and values of the user uh, world. And I'm going to give you a few uh, examples of what this, uh, what this feature might look like with these things uh, fused together. So, uh, so what I'm going to do uh, is give you three different uh, example projects um, that sort of aim to illustrate this, uh, uh, this fusion. Uh, the first project is a project that we're doing with our HealthShare Health Insight uh, offering, which is a healthcare analytics uh, database. Uh, when you think of healthcare analytics and you think of users, if, you would, uh, if a user would ask a question that they want answered, like how many patients do I have or how many visits did I have last month and is it growing, um, that's the way users express themselves. They use sentences. They don't actually speak in SQL. I don't know if you've ever interviewed a user and asked them what they'd want, and they said, select count star from patient, <laughs> where, age. You know, they speak in sentences. So wouldn't it be nice if the user experience was more natural language instead of SQL to query a database? So let me show you what that might look like. OK, what you see is a user just asking Health Insight, how many patients do I have? One of the things that you may um, have noticed about these large language models like ChatGPT is they do a good job writing code. Uh, that includes SQL. So you can see uh, over here in this log, uh, we basically take what the user said, we send it to the large language model, along with what's called the prompt before the prompt, where we kind of describe, here are the tables, here's how they work together, that sort of thing. And back from the large language model comes a SQL statement right there. Uh, and then we execute it on Health Insight to answer the question. So a slightly more complicated statement, how many patients do I have over 60? So I didn't have to say age, I didn't have to reference the age column, I just say over 60, and this can figure out, okay, where age is greater than 60. You can see it down, uh, down there. Uh, this third one, uh, is what are my top three diagnoses? Okay, so this is a separate table altogether. Um, but uh, you can see uh, it's a more complicated query. We have a group by, oh, it's a video, so I can't click over there, but a group by, uh, top three, order by, that sort of thing, and it comes up with the top three uh, diagnoses. And you can see it answers the question. Uh, and then finally, um, I'll ask it, how many diabetic patients do I have Maybe I say over 60, something like that. Oh yeah, just how many diabetic patients do I have? And interestingly, diabetic is an adjective in front of the word patient. So I didn't say how many patients do I have with a diagnosis of diabetes, I just said diabetic patient and it figured out um, that I wanted to join with the diabetes table and do a description uh, like. All right, I'll go back to the slides then. So that's what users would like. That's the way users speak. You know, and we in the software world should deal with the user, not make them deal with us. So that's an example of the fusion, I think, of user concerns and the patient. So the second example I will give uh, is a project we're doing with one of our customers named Bay State Health. Uh, Bay State is a regional health system in western Massachusetts. Uh, they are five hospitals, 80 clinics. Um, they basically kind of cover that, uh, that area of uh, Massachusetts, and we've had a co-development relationship with them for many, uh, many years. Uh, they use our HealthShare personal community as their patient portal, and it's been very successful rolling it out into the community. But the problem with that success is they're getting flooded with patient portal messages. And, uh, and they don't know what to do, basically. So patients can put in messages to their clinicians, and they're having a very uh, hard time sort of keeping up with these messages. Additionally, um, a bunch of these messages are urgent, clinically urgent. So what's happening, even though there's a warning on the patient portal, is patients are typing in messages like, I have extreme chest pain, uh, and then going back and sitting on the couch. 
uh, and awaiting uh, Bay State answering their message. And uh, they were very concerned about uh, this. Uh, and we did a, an analysis of this, and about 3.6% of their messages are urgent. Uh, so they get 1,000 messages a day, approximately, so 36 are urgent, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 36 patients that are delaying their care every day, today, tomorrow, the next day, and they really wanted to take care of these, uh, of these patients and not have this happen. So we partnered with them on using machine learning and some of these techniques to try and automatically identify messages that were urgent uh, so they could um, take a quicker action on these messages. Uh, so the way we approach this is uh, we um, got a team of clinicians together. We labeled a day full of messages to determine sort of which what kind of message is urgent versus non-urgent. We trained uh, a number of machine learning models um, to automatically identify urgency. Uh, and these are the same underlying transformer architecture that ChatGPT um, uses. So the PT and ChatGPT is pre-trained transformer. So we took the original pre-trained transformer from 2008, uh, 2018, not that long ago. Uh, and then there's a the version trained on medical notes and we sort of fine tuned that, added a little bit more uh, urgent messages. Um, and, uh, and then we got to a 93% uh, accuracy. Now, uh, just for um, comparison, 93% accuracy is about the accuracy of if you ask two separate clinicians to look at 1,000 messages and determine how urgent they are, it's the level of agreement that two people would have. So the machine learning model is sort of on the order of human agreement with somebody else. Okay? So, uh, so we felt like this was accurate enough to bring into uh, production. So this is, what it, um, this is what it'll look like. It's in testing. Uh, right now. So on the work queue that the contact center specialist will have, we have a new column about whether the message is urgent or not. Okay, so they can use this column to sort the work list uh, for the urgents on top, they can filter, they can assign it to a different work list, those kinds of, uh, those kinds of things. As it turned out, we talked to another health system that had done a similar uh, project, and patients put in their urgent messages overnight. So most of these messages come in between 5 p.m. and the next uh, morning. Uh, and so, um, so their workflow basically is they come in first thing in the morning, the first half hour is sort of clearing all the urgent messages, calling the patients, uh, get, you know, getting them care, having them talk to a nurse, those kinds, of, uh, those kinds of things. And then the rest of the day they can keep up. So now you have much better responsiveness to the patients. They're not delaying care. As much. They still want patients to not put in any urgent messages, but nevertheless, when they do, they now can automatically see these uh, and respond uh, to them. There's a couple other related uh, projects that we're doing in the same way, sort of machine learning uh, model based on the messages. Uh, the next project is on the user experience side. So it turns out that 16% of these messages are regarding booking an appointment or refilling a medication. And funny enough, those features are already on the patient portal, but the patient didn't know about it or didn't choose to use it. So what we're doing is reading the message, basically using the machine learning model to identify, hey, this is about an appointment request, and then we pop up a message like this, do you know you can book appointments right here on this app? Uh, do you want to go to that booking appointment page or do you want to just send the message? Okay, so it's a redirect for the patient uh, experience. So back to the um, contact center uh, side. The next project is that the contact center specialists were complaining that uh, they had to double click on each message to see what was in there. So, um, so we uh, are experimenting with a project of taking the message, sending it to ChatGPT and saying, please summarize this message in two words. Okay? Uh, and then we add a column on the work list with the two-word summary. Now you can see that uh, ChatGPT doesn't always follow instructions, um, but uh, but it is actually quite hard to summarize uh, a message in two uh, two words. So this is a pretty good job. Gives uh, the uh, the user a sense for what is in these messages, and they'll know how to sort of navigate their way through their through their day. Uh, and the last project is uh, perhaps the uh, the obvious one, which is can you propose a response back to the patient? So we'll send the message, 
saying this is a message from the patient to their health system. Can you please propose a response back to the patient? Uh, and this is an example uh, response. Okay. So um, uh, one of the interesting um, studies that came out in JAMA about uh, six weeks ago is they were evaluating physician responses to patients versus chatbot responses to patients. Okay, you can probably guess what's, what I'm going to say. Um, but the physician responses back to patients, um, there was four, I think it's 4.6% of the messages were rated as either empathetic or very empathetic. Okay, so not that many. So the chatbot responses, it's actually 45% were rated as empathetic or very empathetic. And you can see why. You know, physicians are busy. They sort of get to the point. Uh, and empathy is sometimes more about the surrounding package. Sorry to hear about your troubles. Hope you're having a good day. Uh, do this. Thank you for contacting us. Um, can't wait to serve you again. That sort of, sincerely, you know, that sort of thing. So it kind of lets physicians be quick um, and these contact centers be quick and focused, but we can wrap it sort of in a level of kind of uh, empathetic uh, language. So all these, all these projects um, uh, that we did here are really around helping the use, using machine learning, using these large language models to help these users be more productive, to focus on what they do uh, best, and also improve the patient experience and uh, uh, access to, to care. So this is an area, you know, AI in healthcare has had its, um, I wouldn't say ups and downs, but it really hasn't had its up yet, uh, I would say. Um, and I think these are some good use cases where, where AI now has the kind of capabilities that really help our users. And the other thing that Bay State said, in addition to saving time, which I thought was um, uh, was interesting is instead of seeing these patient messages as a burden, why not see them as a new way to interact and engage with our patients? So we have the hospitals, we have the clinics, we now have virtual care, why not have messages be, you know, a new digital experience for patients that we, that we really allow to flourish? And without sort of dealing with kind of the productivity of responding to these messages, they weren't able to really act on that, uh, on that sort of new care model concept, but now they can. So the, uh, the third project uh, I will talk about is one with our track care e EMR project. This is an electronic medical record we sell uh, around, the, uh, around the world. Um, and, uh, and so many of you may not have it, but this kind of uh, approach could be used with, um, with the kind of software that uh, you build and use as well. Uh, but, but before I get there, I'm going to take a short analogy break because I do love uh, analogies. Um, so I wanted to talk about the 21-speed bike or some, any kind of multi-speed uh, bike. This has always bothered me about these uh, bikes. And now that I have a 1,000 people, I'll tell you what bothers me about these uh, bikes. Now, you remember how to shift gears. There's two shifters kind of on the handle, uh, handlebars. Uh, the one controls the, um, you know, the gear uh, near your legs. Uh, and that one is about, are you in gears 1 through 7, 8 through 14, or 15 through 21? So, and then the other shifter is really around what gear you're in within that sort of band for the rear uh, wheel. So you're shifting along, going from 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 to 5 to 6 to 7. Do you remember how to shift to 8? Anyone? Yes, exactly. You have to go up on one to get to kind of that middle sprocket. Uh, and then you have to go down on the other one to get to the lowest gear. Now, is that what the user is thinking? No. The user is just trying to go, the user is thinking, I want to go up or I want to go down. Right? But basically, the architecture of the bike, the bike is making them deal with the architecture of the bike to think about how this bike really works uh, and how I need to sort of manipulate this architecture. And I think that's kind of the way we build software. You know, we make our users too much deal with the architecture that we need. And an example is actually any data entry screen. We probably all have software that looks like this. This is, a, this is our EMR. But it's filled with text boxes and drop downs and date pickers and radio buttons and hamburger menus and tabs. And you know, this is, 
typical like deal with me user kind of software. But is there a different user interaction model that we could use for something like this? So uh, before I show you uh, the demo, let's just think about the most popular um, sites out there uh, and software out there and how that interaction model works. So what is the most popular, uh, I keep asking you questions like you'll all respond, but what is the most popular website and has been for uh, more than a decade? Google, of course. Now how does Google uh, express itself or allow the user to express it themselves? It's a single text box, right? Google, you just put in what you want and they take care of the rest. What is the fastest growing website in history? ChatGPT. So ChatGPT went from zero to one million users in five days. Uh, and that beat um, the prior software went from, it was Instagram, went from zero users to one million users in 10 weeks. So this was 10 times faster than last year's fastest software ever type of thing. Now how does ChatGPT allow users to express themselves? A single text box. Hmm. So what's nice about this kind of user interaction is you let the users be the users. You just ask them what they want. And you know, ChatGPT is the most complicated software perhaps ever built, but it expresses itself in a very simple way for the user. So that's the idea that we're building and exploring with Track Care Assistant. Is up top there, you have a single text box. Uh, and the clinician or the user just expresses themselves in this text box and we make the work happen. So let me show you, uh, show you what that looks like. I'm a neurosurgeon, um, or I'm playing one, I should say. Uh, I'm actually a drummer, uh, uh, but I'm a neurosurgeon in this case. A uh, patient walks into the ED, might be having a stroke. The ED has called me to evaluate uh, what might be going on. So the patient's name is Diana Frazier, and I want to take a look at her labs, okay? So what you saw is I just typed in part of her first name and the word lab, uh, and I was brought to her lab screen. That actually saved me 13 clicks in our product. So the whole patient lookup experience, the whole open up the chart experience, the whole navigating to the lab uh, tab experience was all sort of taken care of with those two, uh, two words. I see that this patient has high cholesterol, which is a concern for somebody having uh, a stroke. So now I'm just going to ask to summarize this patient. Okay. So we're asking a chat experience here. Let me lower this. Okay. Patient's name, Diana Frazier, born then, female. Here's her allergies sort of thing, so then I'm going to say, um, does she have any risk factors for stroke? Yes, based on medical history, some risk factors including history of transient ischemic attack. Tell me about her TIA. This is a mini stroke, a TIA. Um, she's had one, a little bit about it, warning signs. Uh, what were her past admissions? Uh, so what's happening here, just to clarify, uh, is basically we are packaging up the medical record as text. We're sending that to a private instance of OpenAI's model uh, because of PHI. Uh, actually, this is a demo patient, but uh, in a sense. Uh, and, then, uh, and then saying, given this context, given this medical record, please answer this question. Okay? It's doing an excellent job answering the, uh, uh, these questions. So here, she's had three stays uh, before. I can ask, we have a handy buttons on the bottom. Is there any medication the patient's allergic to? Yeah, allergic to codeine, aspirin, that sort of thing. Okay, so I have determined that she's um, potentially having a stroke. I go up here and I say, add stroke protocol. Uh, what this is going to do is uh, go to the ordering system, pull up the stroke protocol order set, put the whole thing in my cart, uh, and I hit the update button, and I think I sign it. 
uh, and then order the stroke protocol. So this will be do a CT of the head and all those sorts of things to determine the final uh, plan for the patient. So that add stroke protocol uh, saved me six clicks. Uh, so I sort of navigated, loaded up the order set, and got everything uh, teed up for the clinician to review. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to say summarize in SOAP format. Uh, this will summarize Diana's chart in subjective, uh, objective, like lab results, assessment, like what, what is my diagnosis, uh, and then plan, what, what am I going to do later. I can do copy to note. This will copy that all to an ass, uh, assessment note. I don't know how many keystrokes I saved with this. Uh, obviously, uh, what I will do as a, as a user, I will edit it, put in my own assessment, let's say, put in my own plan, hit the update button, uh, and then I'm done. Okay? So uh, what do you think of that? Nice, huh? So I think that's the kind of user experience that our users really, uh, really want. They want to speak naturally to the software and have the software respond to them, not vice versa. So what you saw there, just for clarity, is Track Care Assistant was when I was typing in the top, uh, which is a navigation tool, take me to labs, do the stroke protocol. That is coming out in an upcoming Track Care release. And then on the right, when I was doing the chat uh, stuff, that's still in our kind of work in progress experimental mode. So we need to determine the accuracy, patient safety, patient privacy, use cases. You know, there's a lot to work, uh, work out before putting that kind of use case into prime time. Uh, but it's important for us, like, like Terry mentioned, to sort of always be jumping on the latest technology and exploring what it can do. And I think AI has a lot of potential, but I wanted to focus this morning on the potential of the user experience and really you know, fusing what the user really wants, which is software to deal with them, not, uh, not uh, vice versa, with our concerns and needs uh, on the data side. So I'll give you uh, one last uh, story of uh, fusion from the music, uh, another one from the music uh, world, this one about 70 years later. Um, this is the band, anybody know this band? You can see part of the name. The Police. Uh, the Police were a fusion of reggae uh, rhythms with rock and roll. They uh, created a very interesting sound, were one of the most popular bands um, at, uh, at that time. And um, I won't give you a drum, uh, drum lesson, but, uh, but the drummer sort of grew up in, uh, he's American, but grew up in kind of the Middle East with these balladi rhythms, which are very similar to reggae. And then in London, uh, London's reggae scene before he joined a rock band. So he brought a very different perspective uh, to things. But what I think is interesting about the police is actually the era. So um, their big album, uh, Zenyatta Mandata, came out in 1980. Uh, and 1980 was uh, the same year that uh, Blondie came out, the B-52s, the Pretenders, the Cars, R.E.M., U2. It was just this uh, enormously productive year in, uh, in music. But it was a group of bands that basically were saying goodbye to the 70s heavy metal. You know, the Led Zeppelin or Pink Floyd or Black Sabbath or whatever. You know, this was a group of bands creating a fun, informal, upbeat style for the next decade. And Scott Joplin and his contemporaries were like that as well. They were sort of saying goodbye to the classical music era, the formality, uh, and creating a uh, upbeat, fun, danceable style of music with, uh, with ragtime. And I think it's time for us to say goodbye to the sort of rigid, uh, formal user experiences of yesteryear, where everything's in its place and we're sort of bothering the users with the architectures that we need. And I think we finally are on the verge of having the kinds of approaches and technology that allow us to build the user experiences that are fun and informal and delightful and allow our users to really enjoy uh, using what we, uh, what we build and be more productive and more satisfied. And who knows, you know, maybe some users will tell us one day that every little thing we do is magic. Thank you. <laughs>